Thank you for listening to the Troy Podcast, where we promote, educate, inspire, and entertain creators of all things related to fantasy and science fiction. In this episode, we talk with John Scovran and talk about how his family history helped inspire his latest series, The Goddess War. Book two in that series, The Queen of Ismeros, comes out April 20th, 2021. Look for it wherever books are sold. I am with John Scovran, who is releasing a book called The Queen of Ismeros um, in April. Um, John, uh, take it away, Hi. kind of introduce yourself and what this second book in the um, in this series is. It's a trilogy, right? Yeah, yeah. So this is the second book in the Goddess War trilogy. Uh, the first book, The Ranger of Marzana, came out last April. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, this is, so my name's John Scovern. Hi. And um, <laughs> uh, my first novel was published way back in 2009. It was a, a young adult novel and one of my few non-spec fic, uh, non-sci-fi fantasy novels. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I started off pretty much exclusively in young adult was that Struts and Frets? Um, yeah, that was Struts and Frets. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and that was just, yeah. just about a, a, a kid starting an indie rock band in high school and, you know, kind of dealing with his, his grandfather's uh, Alzheimer's. Um, so it was just a, kind of a really simple kind of book. And then um, I wrote three more uh, young adult novels, all of which were kind of dark fantasy, contemporary dark fantasy. Um, and had a lot of fun with that. But then I started writing this other book that I thought was going to be young adult, but didn't quite seem to be working in that way. And I showed it to my friend, Steph Perkins, and she was like, John, I think this is actually like an adult fantasy novel. And so I took it to my agent and she was like, yeah, definitely. And so uh, I, I wrote that one and sold it to Orbit, um, Hachette's sci-fi fantasy imprint. And um, they bought they have some great authors. They do. It's a, you know, it's a really great program there. Um, Davy Pillai was still there. Um, she was my editor, actually, for the first two books, um, Hope and Red and Bane and Shadow. That was the Empire Storms trilogy. And that was very, like, swashbuckling, um, kung fu, I called it my kung, gangster kung fu swashbuckling romance. Nice. Um, and it was all those things. Um, there was pirates. There was There was, like, very clearly my childhood kind of, like, steeping in uh like old kung fu films um Mm -hmm. and then just you know lots of like loving of the sailing in the seas and the pirates and you know and all that stuff um and a a heavy dose of like early kind of um early new york history um these kind of like larger than life folk tales uh, of of the kind of criminal element there there after i finished up that trilogy I then moved on to The Ranger of Marzana, which was the first book in this new trilogy, The Goddess War. And it's um, kind of started off accidentally. I was just personally researching um, my family's uh, history in, in Poland. I still have some cousins and some other relatives and stuff over in, in Krakow. And so I... I, I always kind of regretted, my grandmother is from Poland, and I always kind of regretted not kind of picking her brains more on stuff before she passed away. And so I decided to kind of, uh, when she passed away, I uh, it fell to me, for reasons that I'm still unclear, to contact the, the, the family in Poland and let them know that she had passed away. Um, and that kind of started things rolling for me. And since then, I, I just kind of got learned more and more about my Polish heritage. And I, I, I don't know uh, if this is a thing that still exists, but when I was a kid, being Polish was like not awesome. <laughs> like, All those like there was, a, kids. There was lots Sorry. of like Polish jokes. Right. Like, I don't know whether that was just like an Ohio thing or like an 80s thing or like whether that's still a thing that exists. I don't know. But it was pretty, you, you didn't volunteer the information. Let's just say that. Um, and my my last name is kind of Polish, but not really. It was changed from a Polish name when, when they came over on the boat, just kind of corrupted, uh, like many names. Um, and so... Uh, but it kind of started this huge kind of research binge, which ended up being the Ranger of Marzana, and Marzana being the, the Polish uh, name for the goddess of winter and death. 
Oh, um, and and there's every year to this day in, in kind of more rural parts of Poland, there is a on the the first day of spring or the last day of winter. I can't remember which one of the two. Um, they take an they build an effigy of Marzana, goddess of winter, and they uh, either light her on fire and then drown her or they just drown her. One of the two. I probably depends on whether those kids uh, are there or not. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, and that's like a thing that happens today. The drowning of Marzana, it's called. Oh, and really? so yeah, yeah, and that 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 thing kind of stuck with me, and and kind of ended up being the the kind of cornerstone that I built this craziness on. Which is awesome because you don't get this um, Slavic Eastern Europe, um, you know, Polish Czechoslovakia type language in fantasy novels a lot of times. Like I think this is one of the first ones that I've read um, with that. And you you know, it sounds like you have you have that part of Europe in there, and you got Giovanni, which is Italian. Mm -hmm. sort of names yeah you know so yeah it's, it's, you know, Jorge, obviously you get, it's a spanish sort of yeah scene going on there which which is a portion of europe that these novels usually don't get recognized usually it's like the viking area or english you get some french every once in a while but right so, so this is awesome I, i've really enjoyed the book so far oh good i'm, I'm only about halfway through um but it's it's i've really enjoyed it it's been really cool. fun you know, I've loved, awesome. loved Sonia and Sebastian and, you know, Irina, Jorge, like it's been, I really, I've, I've, I've enjoyed the journey so far. Cool. Excellent. Well, I hope, I hope you continue to enjoy it. <laughs> it gets yeah. pretty, pretty bananas. So, <laughs> so um, that was actually one of the questions that I was going to ask is how you kind of came up with this. And so it was from research in your family history, basically. Well, that and the other thing, I don't know, um, I, probably if you're not Slavic, the difference is, is small. Um, mm -hmm. But if you are, the difference between Polish and Russian is vast. Right. Um, and there, you know, I'm sure my grandmother rolling around in her grave, um, uh, but, but the names are mostly Russian. Um, and that's frankly just because I think Russian names are some of the most beautiful things ever. So like, I just couldn't resist. Also... At, at completely, I can't even remember why, for whatever reason, I was also, I was researching Catherine the Great mm -hmm. um, of Russia. And uh, I, I also, um, I used to be an actor um, back in the, in the day, and I studied at Carnegie Mellon School of Drama. And um, at the time, I don't know if this is still true, but at the time we had a, uh, uh, a like a, a kind of, I don't know what you call it, partnership with uh, Moscow Art Theater. And so there was always like a trade of teachers and students and so forth, back and forth mm -hmm. between us and Moscow. And we had three uh, teachers from the Moscow Art Theater while I was there that I, I trained with uh, quite a bit. And we also had a lot of classes in Chekhov, who was kind of one of the big Russian playwrights of all time. He's like the Shakespeare of Russia. And uh -huh. um, so I, I also had this kind of deep background in Russian uh, literature and, uh, and drama. And, and I always kind of wanted to do something with that. And I thought, well, you know, I'm going to cheat a little bit here. And even though it's kind of a Polish based culture, uh, I used a lot of Russian uh, as far as names and, and, yeah. and, and stuff like that. My, my great grandpa passed away just uh, six years, eight years ago now was from the Ukraine. Oh, cool. And so kind of, he was, he spent some time in the USSR before he came over, you know, in the early forties, twenties, he was born in the twenties. But so, so yeah, I kind of understand the difference between, you know, even all the countries that kind of like to have their own identity, mm -hmm. even though they were under the USSR at the time. One of the key things that really fascinated me about Polish history and that I delve into quite a bit with Izmiros in this first book is there was about a hundred years where Poland didn't exist as a sovereign nation. Oh, really? Um, yo, yeah, they, they uh, you know, it's weird because way, way back, we're talking like 11th, 12th century, they were like one of the most powerful countries in, in all of Europe because they were one of the few that didn't go get sucked into the whole crusades nonsense. Mm -hmm. And so th when everyone else was just dying in droves, they, they were fine. Um, and they were also at that time, and sadly this is not true anymore, but at the time they were also one of the most generous and open countries. So you could be Jewish and live there and it was totally fine. They were like, they had no problem. They were very clear, like, d you know, don't, you know, no anti-Semiticism here. We're just not, you know, we're into everybody doing everything kind of thing. Um, 
And then somehow, well, I know exactly how, but they went from that to, um, you know, uh, starting with Catherine the Great, actually, she was one of the first people to start carving up Poland, but she made a deal um, with, with um, Frederick of Prussia and, oh gosh, I can't remember who the third party was. I want to say it was the Holy Roman Empire, uh, but I could be wrong. Um, but either way, there were three powers in total, and they just started carving out pieces of Poland. Mm. Um, until in the 1800s, there was no Poland. Like, they just, it was gone. There was no, and so one of the things that really interested me is, like, how do, how do, you, def, how do you retain a sense of national identity or cultural identity when you when your country does not actually exist. Um, and that's when we open the book with Ranger of Mars. That's exactly what's going on with Ismeros. It's like, there is no Ismeros, <laughs> you right. know? Um, it's all just been kind of subsumed into this um, empire, um, the Aramean empire. And, you know, they're like, oh, you know, we're not like overlords. We're not gonna like, you know, like tell you everything to do. But, you know, they get rid of the language, they kind of cut down the culture, some of their biggest religious icons, like the Rangers of Marzana, the Satanic, they, they make them illegal and they ban them and they kill everyone they can find. So, you know, there is this kind of cultural erasure that's happening um, when the book opens. So as you're studying all this stuff, um, I'm sure you have a file that you're kind of keeping notes and stuff. So do you have an outline when you start or do you just say, I have these notes, I want to just dive into it um you know my process has changed over the years i used to be and i i'm, I'm grateful for you not referring it to it as a pan as a pantser because that's like i, <laughs> I just I just really unappealing sounding right. i like right. i i like uh georgia r martin's um gardener versus architect uh thing a little bit but but i don't even i think it's i don't think it's there's like actually a real binary there I think it's an illusory thing that we, we as when we're first starting out as writers, we kind of create this idea that you're either this or you're that one. In fact, most of the time it's kind of not really, it's both. So I used to just like sit down and just start writing. And understandably, like my drafts were, my first drafts were a hot, hot mess. Right. And, you know, it would take multiple drafts just to like beat it into submission so that it was a sensible plot. Um, and as I've gone on, I've found that, and as I, you know, this has become from like a passion and hobby to a profession, um, I, I've had to kind of be a little more thoughtful and, and kind of premeditative. And I, so what I, what I typically do now, um, is I'll write a couple of chapters, mostly to get the tone and the voice more mm -hmm. than anything. I just want to get that feeling for it, you know? And then I'll be like, okay, usually I hit a point where I'm like, oh, I don't, okay, I don't, you know? And that's when I know, okay, why don't you take, take a, st stop yourself and, um, and, and, and start working out an outline. And then, and, and one of the things initially that w I was reluctant with outlines is because you get this sense that the outline is the outline and you got to follow the outline. But in fact, the outline is also a revision, a draft, a, it's a rough outline. So just like the draft itself, you can change it. You know, if it doesn't work, if it ends up, you know what, in, in, intellectually, this seemed like a good idea, but organically, now that I'm writing and I'm at that moment, it doesn't make the kind of sense that I thought it did. Um, you know, yeah, it's, it's so, a skeleton, it's not the book itself. Exactly, and and just as mutable as the book, just as yeah. mutable as the prose itself. So, um, so that's what I do now. I write a couple chapters to get the feel, the voice, the tone, and then I go back and I hammer out an outline, and then I, and then I kind of plunge back into the the actual prose once I've got that sorted out. So you have um, roughly about a dozen books under your belt now. Um, as the amount of revisions and edits change like when you did stress and fresh like how many times did you have to revise that versus the queen of ismeros oh well, i mean it, i i've definitely got more efficient okay. um, as times goes yeah i mean like i i actually could not tell you how many revisions struts and frets went under and 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 it was a pretty simple book more complicated was my second novel misfit which is about a demon girl in catholic school um, it had like multiple timelines and a much larger cast and a lot, you know, a lot more world building and stuff like that. And that, whoo, that was a lot of drafts. That was 
Oh, uh, at times it was so many, it was so many drafts that there were times when I was like, should I just give up? Like, is this, does this suck? Am I like, you know, um, thankfully, um, I had an incredible editor, uh, Maggie Lehrman, um, over at Abrams at the time. I, I don't know if she's, I, maybe she's still there. I'm not sure. Either way, Maggie Lehrman, if you ever get a chance to work with her, she's amazing. Um, and she was a perfect newbie author editor and really kind oh, of cool. like, like kept me calm and kept me from freaking out and being like, all right, we're going to work this out. You know, maybe you should think about this and that. And, you know, she, she didn't tell me how to fix the problem. She just pointed to the problem and then kind of gave me some avenues and, you know, um, which was incredibly helpful and uh, just very grateful to her for, for that. You know, and then over the years, you get better at this sort of thing. I mean, you know, 12, I guess it's 12, is it? I haven't sat down and counted, honestly. Um, but like definitely fewer drafts. Um, with that said, um, each book kind of has its own requirements. So the tricks that work in, the tricks that got me through the Empire of Storms books did not necessarily pan out in, in uh, the Goddess War books. Um, you know, you got to kind of reinvent the wheel to some extent for every project. Um, so, but, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I just finished up the rough draft of book three, uh, the, the Wizard of Eventide. And I think, you know, by the third book in like, a, like this massive epic fantasy, I think I finally got it now, guys. <laughs> you know, like I figured it out, um, you know. Uh, but some of that is, it's, you know, it's conflict. Third books are kind of their own monster in, in any sort of trilogy. I mean, each book in a trilogy has its own specific kind of challenges as well. And in addition to like a project having its own challenges. So uh -huh. there's always not stuff to learn. You're always kind of figuring it out. But I guess in general, I've gotten a little more efficient at it. So uh, is the third book going to come out this next year? In 2020. Yeah, yeah. The book two, Queen of Ismeros, comes out in April, and then book three, Wizard of Even Time, comes out April of 2023. I guess. 2023. No, 2022. Yeah. Um, so, what is like typical day writing? Like, do you have a word goal, a scene goal? Um. Yeah. So, um, you know, usually uh, I I do. I don't have like a, a hard word goal, but I, I usually, um, I, I, I there's a few things that I like to have. I like to end it in a place where I know what happens next. Mm -hmm. I, I don't like, I have learned over the years that if I end, like if I write all the way up to the point where I don't know what happens next, or I haven't figured that out yet, I am, it's really hard to get started the next day. Like I have yeah. to really push myself hard. Whereas if I find myself, oh, you know, I've got about 4,000 words, like, you know, I could keep writing a little longer, but you know what? I, I know what happens next. I'm looking forward to writing that scene. So I'm going to stop here so that tomorrow morning I'm like, bam, ready to go. Right, right into it. Knocking. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That said, I never just start cold though. I usually go back and revise what I wrote the day before, okay. partially to clean it up mm -hmm. and partially because it gets me back in that headspace. Okay. Um, there's always a couple of things I kind of need to do because I've got so many projects going on simultaneously um, that um, I, there's a few things I do to kind of lock myself in. One is that I go back and revise what I wrote before. Um, another one is um, I have like a specific playlist for each book and each project. Um, and so I'll start kind of like listening to that kind of music that I've kind of defined as the tone. So, okay. Yeah. Nice. I, I know a few authors that do that. So, I mean, like three novels, three epic fantasy novels in three years is, you gotta work pretty hard to get that done. I mean, I, I mean, as crazy as it sounds, like it was way more intense for Empire of Storms because Davy, um, do you, I, don't, I don't know if you know Davy Pillai. She's currently now uh, ed, uh, ed, publisher, editor, co-publisher. She's fancy um, now. Um, and she was always, I mean, she's always fancy as a human being, but um, she has a fancy title now um, over at Tor. But okay. um, when uh, she acquired Hope and Red and the Empire Storms trilogy for Orbit from me a while back, and one of her conditions of on acquiring, um, she went, she bought it in a preempt, and one of her conditions was, can you write, I want to release these books nine months apart. 
Kenji oh, wow. I, I had written the first book and that was it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, that was crazy. Um, I, I said, I can do it if I quit the day job, you know, in, and it was, so then it became like, well, how much money do you need to quit the day job, blah, 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 all that stuff. Um, and that's actually how I, I started writing full time was because Davey had such unreasonable demands. Um, <laughs> and faith. And, and faith in me, I guess, yeah, that I, that I could do it. Um, so yeah, so, so that was crazy. Um, and, and a much more intense schedule. Like uh, my daily word count was closer to six or 7,000. Oh, wow. Um, which is brutal. And by the end of it, your brain is mush. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and sometimes like, I, I find that I've got maybe between five, uh, five and six hours in me before my brain becomes useless. Um, as far as writing goes, but that doesn't mean that I don't then go on to do research either for the next project or, you know, that kind of stuff or, or all those piddly little things that you got to worry about, like responding to emails and, and so forth. Doing interviews um, with guys you don't know. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Uh, that part's fun. But, um, you know, there's always these kind of, you know, it's like, I, it's funny every year when I do my taxes, I feel like I'm, oh my God, if I'm, I pat myself on the back so much. I'm like, I did my taxes. It's like, this is what <laughs> everybody does. But like, I don't know why it feels like this amazing accomplishment every year. I get very proud of myself. Um, Cause it's, you know, sometimes you have no patience for the work and then other times like you have no patience for anything but the work, mm -hmm. um, which is a little challenging when you've got, you know, kids and stuff and you're like oh guys now they're yeah. teenagers now so i i can actually say that stuff but like back in the day i had to be like okay you know <laughs> right. they can be a little bit more forceful i have a my oldest is almost 13 so mm -hmm. yeah i'm like all right now you're an adult i can kind of talk to you a little bit different. well not at a yeah but not an adult exactly but you right. know you can but, kind of you can be more candid with them. yeah um and in fact I, I personally believe that like you should be um, like, let's not pretend that we're like these all powerful, all knowing beings. Cause we're not right. Um, at least I'm not anyway, maybe you are. <laughs> um, not yet. <laughs> so you say you have lots of projects you're working on. Um, I'm sure you have tons of ideas going on in your head. Like, what do you know when to, to write, what to put your side, what's a bad idea? Like, how do you Ooh. feel to do that? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, I think over time you develop kind of an instinct for it, but you know, as I was saying, Hope and Red, I thought was gonna be a young adult and it ended up being an adult fantasy. So even when you have an idea and even if it's a good idea, you may not necessarily know where what it is right away. Um, I can't tell you how many projects I've abandoned. So, so many. Some of them, they just, they're just in a bone pile. Mm -hmm. And I, I've keep them all. I never throw anything away. So they're just text files. I'm a big nerd. And so I write everything in plain text using multi markdown, which is a, a markup language. Um, so they don't take up much space. They're just plain text files. Um, so I just keep all of it in, in like archives and tag it. And but some of it I come back to years later sometimes <clears throat> and I go, oh, you know what I mean? Maybe not exactly this, but something like this is workable. And I'll figure out like kind of where it was not working. Um, because maybe I've grown as a writer or I don't know. Um, other times I'll cannibalize components of something like maybe the, the story wasn't working, mm -hmm. but there were elements of the world building that was. And, and that's a key thing. I think, you know, a lot of times it starts with an idea, right? Or, right. or a world or a setting or something like that. But if there's no story, there's no story. I mean, right. you know, you can't write a book without a story. So I think a lot of maybe inexperienced writers don't re don't differentiate those things and realize that you, you really do need a story. <laughs> you can't just like have a world. <laughs> yeah. Worlds are great, you yeah. know, um, but or like, a character. You, like, I yeah, really like yeah. this guy. You, you, all these elements, ever, except for theme, whoever talks about theme, I was like talking to my son about this the other day and he was like, drooling as he's like online watching his like English class and I'm like you know like it kills me when you're so bored in English and he's like what I was like what are you talking about and he's like theme and I was like oh yeah never mind oh yeah well <laughs> that's the worst so, like nobody should ever talk about theme it's like I don't know any author who's like yes the theme yes mm. right you know maybe there are I probably just offended a bunch of people but like I can't I just can't themes are nonsense but yeah character <laughs> setting plot you know all these aspects you know you got to kind of think through 
but I think it's okay to like abandon something as I've done many times. Um, now that I've got enough novels under my belt, I also have kind of a third like external checks on this stuff. Like I'll, I'll come up with like a, a, a treatment or a, or a pitch for something and I'll show it to my agent or I'll show it to my editor or I'll show it to somebody else. And, and they'll be like, uh, 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 you know, like this, like these middle grade books I've been writing lately. Um, the first one uh, that I told you came out in September is called The Hacker's Key and um, kind of a classic spy, you know, travelogue, um, you know, globe trotting adventure thing. And um, it was basically just, I sent my editor just like a bunch of ideas and I was like, pick one. <laughs> and he was like, eh, that's what the schools want right now. And I was like, let's do that one then. It'll sell some books, um, which sounds horribly commercial and crass, I suppose, but I had so much fun writing it that I don't feel bad about it. <laughs> well, one of the things, don't feel bad about that at all because one of the things to be a writer is people want to write. In order to write full time, you have to sell the books. Mm -hmm. so it's good for um you know you have that access to an editor to where they can be like this is what the schools want where people like mm -hmm. me like just kind of going blindly like throwing paint yeah. on the wall and hoping it you know mud on the wall and hoping it sticks you know yeah no i mean and the thing is is like when i say this is what the schools want i don't actually know what the schools want this is what scholastic thinks the schools right. want which may may or may not be true i mean i think they're probably better informed than most yeah, I but, would agree you know, I, I think just as easily if you can kind of connect with some librarians and and educators and stuff, you know, but but I do think it's a worthwhile endeavor. I, I differentiate in my mind between a writer and an author. Mm -hmm. um, like the writer is the art. That's like the creative kind of making of the magic um, where an author is all the business stuff. It's doing interviews. It's, you know, responding to social media. It's, you know, talking to, to librarians and educators about, you know, what kids are into or, you know, going to cons and finding out what, what adult readers are into, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. You know, the more of the hustle aspect, I guess. Right, which is necessary if you want to be a, an author. If, 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 if you've got two teenagers who are about to go to college, it is 100% necessary. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, you said Struts and Frets, your first book, wasn't uh, speculative fiction. Hmm. So what made you decide to go into that genre? The oh, I was always a big sci-fi fantasy fan forever and ever i i struts and frets was the anomaly but and it, it's yeah it was just because you know um my agent at the time was like you should try this new young adult thing there's this twilight book that just came out and it seems to be selling rather well so i i just i needed to tap into something very personal very intimate for for a young adult um and there's a lot of me in that book um exactly. I, you know i was in in an indie rock band in high school my grandfather did you know have dementia and like all the stuff that's going on there but i always uh, uh m have always been mostly focused on sci-fi and fantasy as as a reader as a viewer as a, as a fan so do you remember like the first book or tv series or movie that you're like oh man this is awesome I mean, there's, I mean, I can think of a couple. I mean, you know, the, probably my earliest memories, I think like a lot of people my age, um, like the, the, I remember, I remember seeing very distinctly, I remember seeing Return of the Jedi in the theater yeah, and me too. just freaking out when I was convinced that the emperor was totally going to turn Luke and, you know, <laughs> and I'm like sobbing in the movie theater. My father's just like so embarrassed and he's like, Stop, stop crying. I'm like, oh, my Luke, you know, and uh, it's, uh, you know, anyway. Um, so like, like Star Wars was probably one of my first, first really big uh, uh, speculative fiction loves and comics as well. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have a ton of comics, but oh, I treasured them like so much. I had this one Spider-Man comic that I just love was introduction to the green of the Hobgoblin, I believe. Oh yeah. And um I had uh, this Rom comic. I don't even know if you know who Rom was. He was, no. he was a sci-fi space knight guy. He was cool. And a Conan comic. So like early on, I had that kind of steeping and stuff. Um, and then- you Remember like the first like, book you read? Yeah. The first book that I loved was Benicula. Um, which I guess, is that sci-fi fantasy? Uh, I mean, I think so. I, I think yeah. he was a vampire rabbit. I don't think, <laughs> you know, like, I think it's true. It was real um i'll fight anyone who says otherwise <laughs> um 
but the the when I knew that I was like locked in, like when fantasy and, and sci-fi was like my thing, was actually embarrassingly enough, Piers Anthony was 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 the author who really did it for me. Let's see, uh, right there, all my Piers Anthony books. Oh wow, I can't really see what they are. No, but, that's but exciting. yeah, I love so, Piers Anthony uh, as a kid. I, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, he's, you know, he's he, he, the other one that I really loved back then was uh, David Eddings, mm, the yeah. Gariot books. Um, and that kind of fostered my love of the kind of epic fantasy genre, I think, because it's just, you know, these massive sprawling five book stories. And, and, and the other thing that I think that I really honed in on with the David Eddings books was, you know, like the pieces of things were fun, but like as far as character development went, I felt like David Eddings, like that, his core cast of characters were so, you felt such an intimate knowledge of them that, you know, you really felt like you were like hanging out with them. And I must have reread that all 10 books of those series, um, oh gosh, probably five, six, seven times, just reread them over and over because I would miss those characters, you know? Yeah. Um, granted, I had few to no friends, so that's part of the problem. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, so that was, David Eddings was a huge impact in terms of, I always knew that character comes first is for me as mm -hmm. a writer. Like character is always king. Like I don't go anywhere until I know my characters. Yeah, it kind of sounds like the same with me. Like I, I was in, uh, The Sword of Shannara was like the first like epic fantasy that I read. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember those. Yeah, the, so those are great. I got a chance to meet Terry Brooks a few years ago and I was like, you know, I got you, um, you, William Goldman, and J.R. Tolkien, because, like, Princess Bride came out when I was, like, in fourth grade, and so I was like, oh, I got to read the book now. Yeah, um, yeah. And then I got The Hobbit in fifth grade and The Sword of Shannara. So, like, those three books, like, that in my gateway. Uh -huh. And I was like, yeah, Terry, yeah. You, you really messed me up. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm in good company. <laughs> uh-huh. So um, what advice would you give to any aspiring writers? Um. Well, I mean, you know, the, oh gosh, there's so much. Um, I mean, I, I think the the number one thing that I, and I'm always surprised when this is not true or when people, rather when people don't realize this, is that you have, you don't immediately know it all and you should not expect to immediately know it all. Um, sometimes it, 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 it comes across as sort of an arrogance, like they're unwilling to, to kind of investigate and figure out and learn from others. Um, maybe, maybe they're frightened of, of being exposed as not immediately great, or I don't know what. Um, other times it comes across as like they expect to be good and they're really hard on themselves because they're not, you know? But there's this kind of, and I, I, it's, it's really interesting, my, my mother, um, She's a retired therapist and, and in her retirement decided to pursue her, her first passion in life, which was painting. Um, so she's now embarked uh, in this, this like new life as a painter. And it's really cool because for the first time she and I could, are starting to develop a common language about creativity. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and I'm kind of watching her go through all these like steps as a creator and, you know, initially, uh, and I, Ira Glass talks about this, um, this American Life uh, producer, um, and it's quite, he, he says it pretty succinctly. And um, basically the idea is that when you first start as an artist, you know what's good. Like you, that's why you became an artist because you appreciate quality stuff. But, but there's a massive gap between what you know to be good and what you can actually execute. And that's because you haven't yet developed your craft. Right. And there are some people with natural ability that their craft just happens to be further along in the development process, just because. Yeah. Um, but the core of what you need is already there, which is frankly just comes down to taste, like knowing when it's good right. for you and mm -hmm. what is good differs from person to person. But like, but you, the whole idea early on as an artist is to narrow that gap between what's in your head and what you can actually produce. And it takes a lot of patience um, with yourself. Um, so that's, you know, every, I, I, I've said, I've, I used to do host like a forum where I would talk to um, young folk at the, at the Arlington library uh, um, about writing and so forth like that. And, nice. and I would always, not always, but I would often remind them that every day that you don't give up 
is another day that you can keep that you keep going, right? Like every day you just have to say, okay, well, the day is not the day that I give up, right? Um, it may not be great. I may not even get anything done, but I'm not giving up today. Um, and so early on, it, it's really kind of a slog like that, but it does, you do have to put in the work. So be kind to yourself, but also, you know, work. Because yeah. like, you know, some people think it's just, I don't know what they think it's going to happen. Um, you do have to put in the hours. I mean, like early on, you know, I was, you know, newly married with a baby and, you know, making like not much money working in a warehouse and just kind of barely getting by. Um, and I was writing... Uh, struts and frets um, and misfit actually too um, in like comp notebooks on the bus ride to work and home because I couldn't afford a laptop you know I couldn't you know I and I, I was working you know in downtown Seattle at this warehouse and like you know so I, you know and then so I would write on the way to work on the, I had this like hour-long bus ride in either direction because we couldn't afford to live in Seattle proper you know and all that stuff and then, you know, and then once the, the baby was in bed, you know, I, you know I, I'd come home and, 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 and their mom would be like, hair. And I'm like, yeah. okay. And so, you know, I do all the evening stuff, the bath and the bedtime, all, all that stuff. And then once the baby is finally in bed, then I start writing again for like several hours until I can, you know, barely think. So early on, wherever I could and if I wasn't writing I was reading you know reading outside my genre reading stuff that I wouldn't normally read just trying to like figure out how did they do that what does that you know rereading the same book over and over again if it really captures you initially because then after a certain point it loses its magic which is sad but also helpful because then you can really kind of figure out what was going on deconstruct it like right like why did it really grab yeah. you kind of stuff so you know that those are the kind of things that I did early on um, from a creative standpoint. From a professional standpoint, I'd say you know I mean like first write a novel, yeah, <laughs> and then sell, and then try to pitch it to an agent. Um, which are it's really easy to find agents now. Most of them are on Twitter. Most of them say what they're looking for. You know, go find pick an author you like. Look in their acknowledgement section in one of their novels. They usually thank their agent, so you know the sort of agent. If the, if if you like this author. And the agent obviously likes that author. Chances are there's going to be some overlap in taste. So the Queen of, Queen of Ismeralds comes out in April. Are you doing like an online release for party or any? Are you, I don't know if you'll be able to tour by then or. Oh, I, I'm not getting my hopes up for a tour. Yeah. You know, Ranger Marzana like had all that stuff booked because um, it came out in, you know, beginning of April, right before right after everything, you know, like everything got locked down. We had already booked everything and then everything got locked down. Um, I was gonna do a bunch of like DC local events and stuff. Um, I don't know, I mean, it's the second book in a trilogy. So it's not, you know, there's usually not a ton of stuff. If I can, if we are allowed to by then, I might wanna do just like go to like my local indie bookstore and be like, let's just do a thing because we never got to do one for the first book. Yeah. Um, uh, but I, as of right now, I don't, I don't know what's, it's a bit early. I'll probably find out maybe next month or so when, you know, if they're going to do anything or what they're going to do for Orbit. Um, reviews are starting to come in. There was a really nice one from Publishers Weekly. They just came in last week. So hopefully that'll, that'll, that'll drum up some business. Yeah. Um, but well, as of right now... <laughs> What, what's that people are stuck home so people are reading a lot more yeah things, so. which is great i mean you know it's we're one of the few arts and entertainment industries that is not completely crippled right now yeah. which is you know i'm grateful for that so fantastic well thanks for joining me today i appreciate oh, it's my pleasure hopefully i can get to meet you at a convention or something yeah yeah once we can do that sort of thing again i, I do yeah. like to go to the cons sometimes if i can so, so. Well, I appreciate everything. Um, oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on here. Thank you for listening to the Troy Podcast. Please subscribe, like, and share with your friends.